This is the 2020 Chevy Corvette. And it is, quite simply, the hottest car of the year. I have never gotten so many requests to review any car ever as the new Corvette. And today, I'm going to do just that. I'm going to start with a little background. The Corvette first came out in the 1950s, and it's been a constant in the American story ever since, right up there with baseball and barbecue. The last few Corvette models have been great, but they've generally been an evolution around a fairly similar theme with a fairly similar look. That changes now. The 2020 Chevy Corvette is the eighth generation model, hence the name C8, and it has a totally different everything, starting with the fact that the engine is in the back, or more accurately, in the middle behind the seats. The Corvette has had 70 years of engine in the front, but that's done now. The manual transmission is also done. The only way you can get the new 8th generation Corvette is with a dual-clutch automatic transmission. Not that you'll be complaining, because the numbers are amazing. The new Corvette comes standard with a V8 that makes 490 horsepower and 465 pound-feet of torque. And that dual-clutch automatic sends it from 0 to 60 in 2.8 seconds. That's a big deal, but here's an even bigger one. It starts under $60,000. Never before in the history of the automobile could you get a sports car with this this level of performance and this level of power for this money. And today, you get to find out what else you get. Because today, I'm going to take you on a thorough tour of the new Corvette and show you all of the quirks and features of the most hotly anticipated car of the year or frankly, of any year since I started doing this. Then I'm gonna get the new Corvette out on the road and drive it, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features of the C8 with the key, which is actually fairly standard. On the back, you have a Corvette logo, and then you have another Corvette logo sort of on the side. This one is just gray and cool looking. And then you flip it over, and that's where all of your buttons are. You have six in total, but the most interesting is the one in the middle, the circle. That would be the remote starter button. You lock the car, press that twice, and it turns on, ready to begin your Corvette experience. And next up, let's talk about what happens when you you unlock the car. Some interesting things. The most notable is in the back. Press the unlock button and you can see the turn signal sort of sequentially flash to let you know that the car has acknowledged your unlock. Up front you also have a similar thing happen. Press the unlock button, the turn signal flash, and then the running lights sort of gradually light up again to let you know that the car is acknowledging your presence. But before I get in the C8, I want to start by getting in the back. There are a few ways to do this. One, you press this little button on the key fob twice, as you can see, and then the back pops open and you can open it up. Or you can come around to the rear of the car. Above the license plate, you have a little rear popper. You press that and the back pops open and you can get in. There's also a button in the interior. But anyway, I'm going to open it up and then you access the rear compartment. Now, as you can see, there are a few interesting items with the rear compartment, starting, of course, with the engine, which is back here. Probably the biggest news about the new Corvette. The engine has been moved to the middle for better weight distribution and basically a better sports car driving experience. But anyway, like I mentioned, the engine is a V8, 6.2 liters, and it comes standard with 490 horsepower and 465 pound-feet of torque. Or you can upgrade to the Z51 package, which this car has. It's a performance package that costs five $5,000 and adds a few items, one of which is a performance exhaust. That gives you five additional horsepower and five more pound-feet, bringing your totals up to 495 horses and 470 pound-feet of torque. And the improvements with the Z51 package go beyond just the performance exhaust and a little bit more power. You also get better brakes or better stopping power. You get better suspension for sportier handling. You get better tires, summer performance tires on the Z51 cars like this one, as opposed to all-season tires 
on other Corvette models. You also get an improved cooling system, which will be helpful on the racetrack when you're doing lots of hot race laps. You get an electronic limited slip differential, which again will help with your steering and handling. And you have a couple of appearance upgrades. The Z51 cars get this front splitter, which gives them a more aggressive look up front. And the C8 with the Z51 gets this rear spoiler, which also enhances the more aggressive look of this car. Now, next up, another interesting item worth noting in this engine bay. This car has the engine appearance package, which gives you two interesting items. One is these LED lights above the engine, so they illuminate your engine and you can look at it and admire it. The engine appearance package also gets you this carbon fiber trim around the engine, which just makes the whole thing look a little bit nicer, a little bit sportier, a little bit better. Now, the other item worth noting back here is that in addition to the engine compartment, this area is also a trunk. As you can see, you open up this rear hatch and you have both contained in one area. Of course, the trunk varies separate from the engine to prevent heat problems, but you can get a pretty fair amount of stuff in this trunk. It's surprisingly large, relatively practical, and it's designed to carry the roof. All of the Corvette Coupe models actually have a removable Targa top, and it's designed to fit back here in the trunk no problem. Let me show you what I mean. To start the roof removal process, you first have to unlatch it. I'm going to start by unlatching the front latches. You can see very easy to do. Just kind of pull them back and then you move on to the rear latch. This one's a little bit more tricky, but it's still very simple, very easy process to unlatch the top. And from there, once you've unlatched the roof from the inside, it's pretty easy to take it out. Just kind of lift it out of the pins in the back and it's surprisingly light. You can just lift it up and walk away and suddenly your Targa roof is off. And from here, you're holding the roof. You want to put it in the trunk. You just bring it around back here. Again, it's pretty light and it goes into some guides along the bottom. From there, you just push it down and it latches into place and then you're good to go. You can close your trunk, your roof is with you and you can drive around in your open top configuration. Pretty easy. And next up, I want to show you the other interesting items with this rear compartment. One is how you close it. There's a little handle built into the underside of the rear compartment, so you can stick your hand in there. You do so, and then you can just easily pull it closed. The other cool thing is that you don't have to slam the rear compartment to close it because it has a soft close feature. Basically, what that means is you can just bring the rear compartment down gently to a position where it seems like it's almost closed, and then the car will electronically do the rest. Take another look at that. It just automatically latches itself so you don't have to slam it down like you might think you would. That is a pretty cool feature. And next up, we move on to the other trunk because this car has two. There's one in back like I just showed you and there's one up front because moving the engine out of here gives you more space and you can use this as a cargo compartment. Now getting into the front trunk has an interesting quirk. There's a couple of normal ways to do it. There's a button in the interior that'll pop it open or you can tap this button on the key fob twice and that will pop it open too. Pretty standard. But my favorite way to enter the front trunk is through the hidden trunk popper in the front end of the car. It's just below the headlight on the driver's side. You reach around under here and you can feel the little rubber trunk popper. You press it and as long as the car is unlocked, the trunk will pop right open and then you can get inside. Take another look, it's right under here and it pops the trunk right open. Now when you're in the trunk, or rather I should say the front trunk since there are two, there are a few interesting quirks worth noting. One is the size. This is a fairly reasonable size and a good complement to the rear trunk. It's more cargo space than you typically get in a mid-engine sports car like this. Another interesting item in the front trunk is the emergency inside trunk release required by the government in case someone tries to kidnap you with their C8. You press this button so you can get out and I just love the diagram on this button. It shows this scared person with his arms flailing jumping out of the front trunk of the C8. At least it very clearly illustrates its purpose. But maybe my favorite thing with the C8 trunk is the way that the trunk lid is designed in the front. You have this sort of jagged edge front end. Almost looks like a puzzle piece how it fits into the bodywork. I love this look. They could have just made it smooth and simple but instead it almost looks like it has aggressive angry teeth even though this is just the trunk lid edge design. It's pretty cool. And since we're on the outside of this car and talking about the look, let's just do it. Let's discuss the styling of the new Corvette. 
I love it. I do think there's one major drawback, which is that the front end design appears a little too visually high compared to the rear and compared to the look of this car. It's almost like the front end is just a little too ungainly and not quite perfect, but otherwise, I love the look of this car. It stands out, it looks far more exotic, far more expensive than it is, and I think they did a really great job. I don't consider it to be really beautiful, but it is a standout, it makes a statement, and it's really cool. Probably my favorite Corvette design since the C2 in the 1960s, which is truly one of the most beautiful cars ever made. And to me, it's a big welcome improvement over the C5, the C6, and the C7, which frankly always just kind of looked like evolutions on the same basic design. We're ready for a big change for a Corvette, and we got one. And next up, let's talk about a few design Easter eggs on the outside of this car. One is on this rear window. You have this kind of fading black piece around the edge of the window. But if you look closely, you can see that the items that are kind of fading are actually little Corvette logos. <laughs> They're all going down the window. I showed you this on the C7 Corvette as well, but the C8 keeps it, and it's a nice little thing. Most people won't notice, but some will especially if they've seen this video. And next up, if you're like me, you're probably wondering uh, where exactly would a front license plate go? Because most of North America and all of the rest of the world requires a front license plate. Apparently you just pop off this little compartment that says Corvette in the front, pull that off, and then there's a bracket that you can mount on here to put the license plate on. But obviously this car is gonna look a lot better with no front license plate. It's really gonna screw up kind of the visual front styling and design of this car where everything comes to a point. But Obviously, in some places, you have to do it, so that's how you would. And next up, here's another interesting quirk. You can sort of see from your angle, the posts for the mirrors are different lengths. On the driver's side, you can see the mirror post. Okay, fine. If you go over to the passenger side and the mirror post is actually longer. This is a visibility issue, apparently. If the posts were the same size, then over on the passenger side, the mirror would be too close to the car and the A-pillar could block the driver's line of sight to the mirror. So they stick it out a little bit further and that's how you get to unequal length mirror posts. Something you don't really notice unless you look very closely. And next up, another interesting exterior item with this car is the lighting, especially in back. There's a couple of interesting items. One is the turn signal. This car has a progressive turn signal, which has become popular in modern vehicles. You can see it turns on and then it gets progressively smaller, which is the opposite of most cars where the signal starts small and gets progressively larger, which is how it is on the Ford Mustang, probably the most common car to use this feature. One other interesting rear lighting item is the brake lights. When I press the brake lights, you can see it's not the whole taillight assembly back here that lights up, but instead just these little lights on the edges. And you notice that was also the turn signal. You put on the turn signal and one of the brake lights goes away to become the turn signal. This is still allowed under US taillight regulations. The interesting thing here is you have all this brake light taillight to work with that could light up for the brake lights, but it doesn't. Instead, it's confined to that little area and it shares the lighting with the turn signal. Something I didn't realize until I started playing around with this car. And finally, our last interesting item on the outside of the Corvette is the cameras. In the front, you have a couple of cameras to give you a front camera view, which is becoming more and more common in more and more new cars. And in back, you have a camera you can see mounted above the license plate to give you the rear camera view, which is now mandated here in the United States. The interesting camera though, is on the top. You can see in the middle, right next to the rear window, there's a camera back there. So what exactly is that for? I'm gonna show you in a second. To do that, we move inside the new Corvette where it's dry and warm. <laughs> and I turn your attention to the rear view mirror because it isn't a mirror at all. Well, actually now it's a mirror, but if you flip this switch, it becomes a camera display. And of course the camera that feeds to that display is the one that's mounted on the rear of the car. And that's why it's placed there. And the benefit of this mirror camera is obvious. Instead of having a mirror where you're just looking behind you and you can see seats and bodywork and it obstructs your vision, the camera, your vision isn't obstructed at all. It's a really cool feature. And one of the coolest things about the mirror camera is its adjustability. For one thing, you can change the brightness in case you want it to be a little bit brighter, a little bit dimmer, whatever you decide. You can also zoom in case you just want to see more or closer or less. You can pick exactly where the camera is displaying. And you can tilt it just like a mirror. You can move it up or down depending on your seating position, where you are in the seat, exactly what you want to see. It's a pretty nifty little trick. 
And next up, we move on to probably this car's most controversial interior item, and that would be the center control stack. You can see there's like a giant line of buttons and switches going down the middle. I counted 20 different adjustments here between all of the buttons and the switches, and they're all just kind of arranged in this one single line in the center, rather than in your usual center control stack arrangement, basically every other car. So let me walk you through this line of buttons. At the very top, you have the controls for the driver's side of things. So the switch on the top adjusts the climate control temperature on the driver's side. You also have a heated seat and a cooled seat there and a few other controls. On the bottom, you have the controls for the passenger side of things. So you can see at the very bottom, again, there's another switch there for the passenger side climate control temperature. And once again, you have heated seat, cooled seat, that's for the passenger side. Now there's not arrows pointing to these sides. You kind of just have to figure out that one side is the passenger side and one side is the driver's side, but you'll get there pretty quickly. Now, all of the other buttons in the center are sort of more general climate control buttons. So you have the buttons on the top that direct the airflow, the switch in the middle controls the fan speed. You can turn on the climate control system, turn on the AC, recirculating air, your front defogger, your rear defroster, all your typical climate control buttons are in the middle. So that's what all of those buttons are in the center. It's pretty much your climate control system integrated into one line of buttons and switches in the middle of this interior. And next up, another very notable item with the new Corvette is its steering wheel, specifically the fact that it's not a wheel at all. You can see it's way more squared off than that. The top and bottom are basically squares, and the side is only a little bit more wheely like you would expect. This is how a lot of race cars are. They have these kind of square looking steering wheels, and they've adopted that in the new Corvette as well. And next up, another interesting item in the new Corvette is the gear selector. There's no lever, there's no dial you turn. Instead, you have this little pod in the center with all the controls. For reverse, you actually have to lift up this switch and that puts the car in reverse. Same deal with drive. Behind that you lift up the D switch and that puts the car in drive. It's a little bit different for park and neutral because those are just buttons you can press. You can see P for park, you just push it, and N for neutral, same deal, just push it and it goes into neutral. But I guess they want you to put a little bit more effort into going in reverse and drive because those are the gears where the car can actually move. Now at the base of this pod you also have one more button with an M on it. That of course puts the car in manual mode and then you can use the shift paddles from there to go through the gears yourself. And next up, some more interesting items in this area. I'm going to start with these three little buttons next to the gear selector. Over on the right, you have a button with a camera marked front. You push that and it pulls up the front camera display on the center infotainment screen. And look at this display. This is so perfect for a low sports car. It shows exactly where your front end is, basically from the top down. So it shows precisely where you are on parking curbs or other obstacles that you might run into. It's a brilliant feature. I wish I had it in my sports car. I love it. And I love how easily accessible it is. You get into it with the push of a button rather than a whole system of menus. And I also feel that way about the next button in this group. You can see the button in the middle here has the front of the car with an arrow. That's the axle lifting system. Check this out. You push that and the front end lifts up almost two inches in just three seconds. This is the best axle lifting system in the car industry. In a McLaren, you have to go into various different menus and press things and then you have to wait like 30 seconds for the front end to lift up. It's ridiculous. This car you're pulling into a driveway with kind of a steep angle. All you do, reach over, tap the button, three seconds later the front end is lifted up so you can clear it. Brilliant feature. And maybe an even cooler feature than the button is the fact that the car can remember locations where it has to raise the axle. So you're going into a gas station you often visit where there's a steep driveway. You can set that in the memory and then every time you approach that location the car will raise the axle automatically because it remembers that that's a spot where it has to do that. And the car can store up to a thousand of these locations. So every problematic driveway in town, you can program into the infotainment system. The car will remember and the axle lifter will automatically go up when you approach them. Pretty cool. And next up near those buttons, you have this little stitched piece with the Corvette logo on it. That is a hand rest. You're intended to put your hand there while you're using the infotainment system. So you have something to rest on. You don't just have to hold it in the air. Or if you're used to driving a manual transmission car, something with a 
gear lever and resting your hand on, well, now you have a place to do that. Now, you can see on this hand rest, you have the word mode printed, which gives you a clue as to where you change your drive modes. You don't just press the mode button. Instead, it's underneath the hand rest. There's a little dial. You can twist it, and that will adjust your different drive modes. You have a few different options. You have the regular mode, which Chevy calls tour, or you have sport mode, which is, of course, a little bit sportier, or you have track mode, which is sportier still, or you have a configurable mode called my mode, where you can configure a few different items like your steering, your suspension, that sort of thing. Normally, I wouldn't mention a configurable drive mode as anything interesting, because a lot of cars that have different drive modes have that, but the cool thing here is it remembers if you have it in my mode even after you turn off the car. So if you have the car in your configurable drive mode and then you turn it off, when you go to turn it back on, it remembers that it was in your drive mode and it stays in it so you don't have to switch over to your drive mode every time you get in and turn it on. Pretty good. And next up, another interesting item about the C8 interior is packaging. This is a fairly small interior with a fairly kind of sculpted driver facing design and the roof comes off, so you can't put anything up there. And that means they had to kind of move some stuff around in interesting ways. One example of that is the hazard lights, which are actually mounted on the ceiling next to the rear view mirror. You press that, that's how you get the hazard lights in the new C8. Another good example, the dome lights or reading lights. You can't mount them on the ceiling because it comes off. So instead, they've put them kind of on either side of the mirror, sort of jammed in there and hidden, but they're there and they work in place, just kind of squeezed in like some other stuff in here. And next up, here's another good example of some interesting packaging in this car, the cigarette lighter. There's no room in the center control stack area for the cigarette lighter, which is where you'd find it in basically every other car. Instead, they've stuck it underneath the dashboard on the passenger side in the footwell, kind of behind the glove box. So if you need to use the cigarette lighter, it's there, but it's just hard to find. Again, some kind of trick packaging. But despite all the kind of clever places Chevy had to stick stuff to get it all in this car, it's worth noting, the center console does still have two cup holders. You press this little lid, it opens up and reveals two cup holders in here. And you also have a center console storage area behind those cup holders. So even though they had to move a lot of stuff around and kind of cram it in place, they were able to get cup holders and storage into the center, which is precisely where you'd expect them. And speaking of that center area, it's worth discussing what is between the seats in this car. A couple of interesting things. One, that's where your wireless charger is. You stick your phone in that little spot and it'll charge for you. It's in between the seats, kind of behind you. Now, above the wireless charger, you have a speaker. It looks fairly normal, except that if you look at it from a kind of very severe angle, you can see the Corvette logo is integrated into the speaker. You can barely see it. You have to be at the exact right angle, but it's there, a hidden little integration interesting Easter egg of the interior. And next up, another notable item in this interior is the climate control vents, which are thin, and I mean really thin. General Motors told me the thinnest climate vents they've ever put in any vehicle. But more interesting than how thin they are is how you adjust them. You have these little switches that you can kind of move around. When you move it all the way to one side, the vent is closed, or you can use the switch to direct airflow. So very thin vents with very minimal controls. Now in between the climate vents over on the passenger side, you can see there's like a little button there. You push that and that opens up your glove box. So if you're curious how to get in, that's where you have to push. Now, once you're in the glove box, you can see it's fairly standard, just a glove box, nothing weird here, except over on the side, there's an SD card slot. So what exactly is that for? Well, it turns out you use that SD card slot in conjunction with the performance data recorder, which you access through the infotainment system. You go in there and you can turn on a feature that will actually record your laps on a racetrack using a built-in camera inside the car. So you can watch later and see like maybe where you missed an apex, where you could improve, accelerate better, brake harder, whatever. Now, a lot of modern performance cars have these performance data recorders, but there are a couple of interesting items worth noting in this one. For one thing, you can choose your overlays. So basically the graphics that will appear on your screen while you're recording or while you're watching it later. You can see your overlay options are none, sport, 
track and timing, but the cool thing here is you can preview them. So if you have it on none, here's what your playback will look like when you watch your laps later. But you go over to sport and then press preview and you can see this is what your recordings will look like later. There's some actual data on the screen, which it pulls from your steering wheel movements or your acceleration or whatever. And you can do the same with track or timing. Here's timing and you can see it shows you like exactly what you might want to know if you're a serious track track driver and you want to watch your laps back to see precisely where you hit each corner at what time on the track all that stuff. It is a pretty cool feature to have built into the car. And another cool feature about the performance data recorder, you don't have to just use it for performance. You can also configure it to be a dash cam that comes on automatically every single time the car is started, it will record. This is a brilliant idea. All cars should come standard with dash cams. It helps figure out what happened if there's an accident or an incident on the road. And it's a great thing to see that Chevy allows the performance data recorder to also double as a dash cam in this car. And next up, a few other notable items with the infotainment system. For one, over to the left of the screen, you have a little knob. That's the volume control for this car. You can see it's kind of out of the way, pretty far for the passenger to reach to get it. But it's worth noting the driver also has a separate volume control on the steering wheel. So the driver has easy access to adjust the volume, but that's the only other volume control in this interior. You can see right next to the volume control, there's a physical button with a house on it. That is the home button for the infotainment system. So if you're deep into some menu, you're lost trying to figure your way back out, just press the home button and you can get there. Now it's worth noting that those are the only two physical buttons for the infotainment system. Everything else is done on the screen, but you always have a group of icons along the bottom that can immediately take you to the usual stuff, like your climate control, your media, your navigation screen, or right to home. Those are always there. So that also makes it pretty easy if you want to navigate around this system. Now I recently reviewed this infotainment system in the new heavy duty GMC Sierra and it's a pretty similar system to that, so I'm not gonna go through everything again. But I will say that this is a very responsive system. The moment you tap it, touch it, whatever, it does exactly what you'd expect, just like you'd expect a smartphone to. And it's all very intuitive, very well laid out, very simple. And next up, I wanna talk about something interesting called Z mode. You see this little button on the steering wheel to the left of the horn, it says Z on it. You press that, the Z lights up, which is a really cool look, and then you're in Z mode. So you may be wondering, what exactly is Z mode? Well, it's a special driving mode on the cars equipped with the Z51 performance package, like this one, and you can configure it in the infotainment system. You go into settings and you can configure how various different parts of the car respond when they're in Z mode. Your steering, your acceleration, your suspension, that sort of thing. Now, one other interesting thing you can configure in Z mode is the the brake response. You can configure how grabby your brakes are on a screen in the infotainment system. It's just crazy to me, but you can do it tour, sport, or track, depending on how much brake you want. Now, you may be wondering, what's the difference between Z mode and my mode, your customizable drive mode? Why would you want one and not the other? The thinking is my mode is something you're kind of always in. Whenever you're driving the car, you have that set for when you're commuting or driving around, whatever. Z mode is something you just tap the button on the steering wheel, go into immediately when you find yourself on a fun canyon road or your favorite twisty spot. It's not something you would want to be in all the time. So maybe Z mode is reserved for a little bit more performance. And next up, speaking of the gauge cluster, you can see it's just one big screen, no more analog gauges here. And it has some interesting quirks to it. One is how it changes when you go between drive modes. All right, right now you're in normal mode or as they call it tour. And you can see it looks fairly standard. You even have a fuel economy display over on the side. You switch into sport mode and things instantly get sportier, just more aggressive, more red, and it just looks a little angrier. And the fuel economy is replaced by a G meter. But my favorite, you switch into track mode and look at it now. It's completely reconfigured for the stuff that matters the most on the racetrack. You can see over on the side, you have all these different performance metrics you might want to see at a moment's notice. That is pretty cool. And it's one of the neat things that a gauge cluster screen 
allows you to do, which is totally reconfigure things depending on what mode you're in. And by the way, one other interesting thing that happens when you change the drive modes, your heads up display changes too. This car, like a lot of new cars, has a heads up display, which is projected onto the windshield and gives you vital information. You can see it right now in normal mode, pretty standard. Go into sport mode and you can see it's just gotten a little sportier. Now it's giving you some more performance information. Go into track mode and again, sportier still for more pertinent heads up display information. It's cool that it's not just the gauge cluster that changes, but also the heads up display. That's a neat touch. And by the way, one other interesting item worth noting in the gauge cluster, if you simply find it to be too much, too much information, too much technology, and you want it to go away, you can just go over to simplify and then the screen will simplify itself. And then you don't have all this kind of stuff staring you in the face at all times. That could be a feature that maybe would appeal to the Corvette's more traditional demographic, let's just say, who don't understand all this newfangled technology. And next up, another interesting item with the Corvette is getting in and out with the doors because they have electronic releases. This is very unusual in the car world, although older Corvette models also had this. To get in on the outside, you kind of reach your hand underneath this little curve and there's a little door popper. You push that and it electronically opens right up. Now, the interesting thing here is this means you can't get in the car if the battery is dead because then the electronic door popper won't work. Except Chevy thought of that and there is a manual release. Check this out. You go into this little vent area by the door, you look up and you can see there is a keyhole in there. You can then easily detach your key from your key fob and you have to kind of try to finagle it to fit it in there, but you can do it, twist it, and then the door will open manually, sort of a hidden secondary release for the doors. Now, once you're inside the car, same kind of situation. You don't have a traditional door handle to get out. Instead, you push this button Button and that electronically releases the door and you open it up from there. But once again, if the battery dies when you're inside the car somehow, you need a manual release to get out and you have it. In the footwell on both sides, you have this little lever you can pull in order to manually release the doors in case the battery is dead and your little door popper isn't working. And finally with this car, I wanna talk pricing. It has been well covered that this car starts around $60,000, which really is an amazing bargain for the money. But most cars won't cost $60,000. This particular one has a sticker price of around $85,000 because it has a lot of options. I'm going to go over a few of those now. If you upgrade from the base Corvette to the 2LT model, it costs about seven grand, and it adds a lot of features you're probably going to want. You get the heads-up display, you get the wireless phone charger, heated and cooled seats, satellite radio, your programmable garage door system on your sun visor. You also don't get navigation on the base model, only if you upgrade to the 2LT. Now, if you want to go further, this car has the 3LT trim level, which adds another $5,000. With that, you get these cool seats. They call them the GT2 seats, and they're a little grippier and nicer than your regular seats. And you also just get nicer trim. The 3LT is more aesthetic stuff. You get a better interior, stitching, suede. Everything just looks and feels a little bit nicer. Now, adding 2LT and 3LT takes you up to about $72,000. But like I mentioned, this this one has an $85,000 sticker price. One reason for that is that this one has the Z51 performance package, which like I mentioned is about five grand. And then there's some other stuff too. This car has the magnetic ride control suspension, about $1,900. The front axle lifter is extra. That's about $1,500. You tack on a lot of this stuff and that's how you get to 85 grand for a new Corvette. But when you look at the numbers on paper, it's still a pretty good deal. And so those are the quirks and features of the new 2020 Chevy Corvette, the C8. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the C8. I've wanted to do this ever since they announced it, as everyone has, and I'm thrilled that I have the chance now. All right, first impression of the car as soon as you get inside, it's actually pretty roomy. I drive a lot of these mid-engine exotic cars, uh, and more and more they all tend to be pretty roomy. It's a lot of tall people buying these cars, and automakers know that. But this one I would say is unusually so. Uh, it's got a lot of space. I'm sitting fairly comfortably, and I can actually move my seat back several more inches um, and I'm six foot three six foot four so if you're a tall person you can really feel like you're able to drive this car now the first thing you notice when you start driving is there's really good throttle response immediacy 
uh, even if you don't have to downshift, even if you're just tapping the throttle, you want to get a little bit more speed, just instant. There's good torque, but more importantly, it's just it's just a quick response. And I think a lot of consumers, even if a car is fast on paper, if they don't feel that when they first tap the throttle, they're gonna be disappointed with how it feels. And this car, you don't have to worry about that. It certainly starts to go. One thing you notice right away as you start really driving is the transmission is just so smooth. Everybody's going to these dual clutch transmissions now, um, but this is clearly one of the smoother ones. I'm in sport mode and you really don't feel gear changes all that much. It doesn't hurt. There's no real smash of the transmission going into the next gear. It's all just really smooth and easy. Of course, the car obviously really, really, really quick to accelerate. But to me, I mean, all cars are quick to accelerate now. Zero to 60 and 2.8, 2.9, that's insane. That's an amazing number. But everything in this world is kind of in the low threes or whatever. The amazing thing though, to me, I, the, the transmission is just so smooth and so quick. And it's really amazing, especially because this is the new Corvette. We're not in a Huracan. We're not in a 488. This is a Corvette. It's Chevy. And it's only 60 grand, 70, even this one at 80 plus. Now, to me, there are pros and cons of the interior. Uh, in terms of quality, I really like it. I was not one of the people who thought that the C7 had that great of an interior. When it came out, everybody was like, this is such an improvement. I always thought it was kind of okay. But this car, I think, really is a lot better. There's virtually no plastic or cheap plastic in here at all. That's partially because this is the 3LT model. So we have stitching everywhere. We have leather everywhere, nice finishers, etc. But generally speaking, this really is a nice interior. To me, this is the first Corvette with like a really interior that really matches the price point and the kind of the world that they're trying to go after. I love the square steering wheel. I'm super into that. I think that looks really cool. I love that any car that does it uh, does not take any getting used to. You just drive it like a normal steering wheel, but it looks cooler and has kind of that racing lineage to it. Steering and handling, I try to evaluate most of the cars I film on the street, which is where 99% of people are going to drive them. Um, so it's a little bit harder to kind of really get a feel of how hardcore it is. You want to get into some hilly driving, some racetracks. Maybe I'll do that in the future with one of these. But generally speaking, it, it feels like it steers pretty well. I generally prefer mid-engine cars. I think that that is the layout that God intended for sports cars to be in. If you think about it from a weight distribution perspective, it makes the most sense. I've owned a lot of front-engine sports cars, but the ones that have really stuck out to me are mid-engine cars. Uh, it's just better. Generally speaking, it's hard not to be impressed with this car. I mean, zero to 60 and two point something. Uh, this one's 85 grand, but to me, it's still a bargain at that number, especially when you compare it against rivals, which are basically all exotic sports cars that cost five times more. Now, obviously there's a lot of reasons to get those cars. You know, Ferrari will always have a stronger branding than Corvette, same with Lambo, whatever. And, and frankly, to me, those cars do have more striking appearances and interiors, but <laughs> this car costs a quarter of what those things are. I mean, it's an unbelievable deal. And so that's the 2020 Chevy Corvette. This is the most hotly anticipated car of the year, and it lives up to the hype. It's not perfect, but you can't argue with the sheer insanity. This is a mid-engine sports car that does zero to 60 in under three seconds, like a McLaren or a Ferrari or a Lamborghini, except this starts at 60 grand. This is huge. And now it's time to give the new Corvette a Doug score. And the Doug score is here, and the figure is truly unbelievable. A 68 out of 100, which places it higher than basically anything in its price point, and within close reach of the McLaren 720S, Ferrari 488, and Lamborghini Huracan. The big news here, though, is that the C8 actually ranks higher than the new Porsche 911. And why wouldn't it? The C8 is faster, cheaper, and right now, much cooler. The launch of the new 992 was laughably small potato compared to the unreal interest in the new Corvette. Admittedly, the 911 wins in the daily categories because it has extra seats and higher quality, but the C8 has a higher weekend score, and the C8 also gets a 9 out of 10 in value, which it deserves. I love German cars, and in my world, Corvettes don't beat 911s. Well, that's changed. One word of caution, though, the C8 gets an 8 out of 10 for cool factor, but that number will probably lower as these become far more common in the coming months.